Today's presenters will be Gus Chikala, President and CEO of Project Assistance, and Jim Colton, Practice Portfolio and Project Management. I'll pass it over to Jim now. Thank you, Dan, and good afternoon, everyone. We appreciate your attendance today. I am going to launch this with the uh, agenda for today's session. So we're going to start with talking about some common challenges in monitoring and controlling projects. If you're able to join us in our last webinar, uh, this is really the second part of a two-part uh, series, if you will. Last time we talked about getting projects off to a good start through a solid planning process. Today we're going to really talk about keeping projects on track through monitoring and controlling. So we're going to go into some of the common challenges, uh, potential pitfalls around monitoring and controlling projects. We're going to define, you know, what, what is good project control? And what are some techniques to keep projects on track? We're going to go through a demonstration around best practices on updating project progress. We're then going to share some best practices and a further demonstration on analyzing your project plans, revising them, and reporting. Finally, we'll talk about changing organization's execution process. And we'll do a wrap up summary and we've got a couple part of this. So again, thanks for joining today. So let's get into the business challenges. In, in our experience, these are common challenges we see in most organizations. And we're, we're really focused during monitoring, monitoring and controlling on getting the right information to the right people at, at the right time so that key decisions can be made, not only at the project level, but in terms of how projects and the project challenges can impact the overall project portfolio of an organization. So the key with um, monitoring and controlling is having accurate and complete data. And it sounds a lot easier than it is in practice, as most of you probably know. Uh, many challenges in collecting the data and then analyzing it and then getting that information back out to the right people at the right time. Certainly keeping stakeholders abreast of project progress is key. Letting them know when you're on track, but more importantly probably letting them know when you could potentially be off track or if you have major issues currently uh, that you're dealing with that are causing uh, project challenges. The other key item to keep in mind is ensuring that the return on, a, on uh, the investment and that the key objectives of the project are being met. So it's, it's important to take periodic checkpoints to revisit that business case that was presented initially and ensure that you're tracking according to the plan. From a technical perspective, it, 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 you know, it's really all about getting an appropriate level of detail. You know, I know Gus talks about the Goldilocks concept, uh, just the right amount of information. You know, not too little, not too much, but just the right amount to make a uh, good decision, getting the right information again to the right people at the right time. It's important if you really want to have solid monitoring and controlling to what we call getting beyond the Gantt chart. So you're not using your project plan as simply a way to check milestones and, and you know kind of evaluate the schedule. To have a really solid plan, you need to make sure you have the right resources at the right time. And you can really only do that through solid estimating and feedback in terms of actuals and remaining work. It's critical to keep the project plan's resource level. So, you know, that you're not working folks uh, into the midnight hours. Uh, and also, just to ensure that uh, project team members and, and partners have the available resources when they're needed. Gus is going to get into in the demonstration, you know, leveraging the views and tables and filters within Microsoft Project to really enable solid project analysis. 
I'm going to talk quickly about you know, some of the key challenges with project controls. And it's really around the three dimensions of managing resources, schedule, and cost. And you know, what are some techniques to obtain you know, what we call accurate and timely both actuals and estimates to complete, more importantly, from those three perspectives? We talked about last time, you know, it's very difficult to measure or manage what you don't measure. So establishing that baseline, as we mentioned during the project planning process, is critical to evaluate progress, you know, down the path of, of the life cycle of the project. Uh, just to get some input from folks and keep you engaged here, we have uh, several polls. This is poll number one. I'm going to launch it right now. Uh, what is your biggest challenge with updating actual progress data? So if you could take a moment, give us some feedback. Is it not understanding how the Microsoft technology works with actuals? Is it, uh, and this is common, cultural resistance to collecting actuals from team members? Standing over the desk and, uh, and prodding them? It could be executive support that uh, you know, there's no incentive for people to report time? Or is it defining the best sources for actual labor costs and schedule information? So we're seeing uh, data is coming in. And not surprisingly, uh, number one, by far and away, is the cultural resistance. So. Uh, I'm going to throw this out to Gus so he can give us some thought about how to attack cultural resistance, unless you want to address that now. I don't mind talking about it. I think, um, <clears throat> I think the problem with culture is uh, it's hard for a project manager to own. So, you know, a lot of times we see challenges with organizations that, that uh, even at the PMO level, it's, uh, it, it's hard to change the culture. I heard uh, a presentation to a group of executives one time, and, and the presenter asked, who owns culture? And um, and the answer was the people at the top of the organization, and and so that cultural resistance I think uh, oftentimes is not necessarily recognized by the people uh, who most uh, can influence making a change. So very closely tied to executive support, I believe. So those two, you know, really go hand in hand. I think you will see in most organizations. Um, People tend to look up and respond to you know how leadership behaves, so it's important for for key leaders to to be good role models and really uh, make things happen. I know I worked in a very large Fortune 100 corporation, and our CIO uh, submitted time a timesheet. He led by example, and he was uh, I think 100 percent. Throughout the year, you know, he was reporting his time um, when scheduled, and it really uh, had an impact on his reports and throughout the IT organization. And I'm pretty sure if you ask my office manager who puts in their timesheet first every month, I'm pretty sure she would say me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, leading from the top. All right, so just some quick definitions, and then we're going to get to the uh, initial demo here. You know, project control as a PM, you, you can't be accountable for everyone's actions. So your, your job is really to report out and raise issues or talk about and you know, mitigate risk as necessary. Um, your job is to deal with the facts, you know, share information again to the right people at the right time. Don't feel like you can control everyone's actions and um, you know you're going to you're going to sit by the developers and your quality assurance folks and the marketing people and make sure everyone's doing their task it's, it's unlikely that you can control all that but really controlling the plan monitoring it analyzing it and really getting that information to the right people is where your focus should be So the collection of the information, uh, we're going to talk about collecting you know, actual labor, 
Uh, getting estimates to complete in both from a cost and a schedule perspective, very important that estimate can to complete. You know, it's nice to look back at the actuals and see how they compare to the plan, but most importantly, you know, learning from those actuals, understanding that you're not tracking according to the plan and adjusting the plan is most important. I, I haven't seen a project yet that um, was delivered, you know, 100% to the original plan. It just doesn't happen. So we need to be flexible, uh, stay alert, and gather the information and adjust accordingly. So the items that, you know, we suggest that are most important in terms of tracking, actual start information, actual finish, actual work, remaining work, percent complete. So, uh, you know, often we do see that estimates can be fairly good for many activities, but the reason the project's running late is you're not starting the schedule. You're not starting that activity because a predecessor activity, you know, pushed you behind. So the estimates, you know, in many activities can be spot on, but the actuals are starting later than planned. So that, you know, it's an important consideration in terms of keeping the project um, headed down the tracks. How does Microsoft Project handle, you know, uh, this tracking information? Well, some folks might, might not even realize that work is equal to actual work plus remaining work. So the total work that's planned will, is a computation. Once you enter the, the actual work, uh, Microsoft will calculate remaining work, so it has to be adjusted manually you know, by the project manager or the, the team member that's responsible for that activity. In fact, you know, Microsoft is going to plug the start date uh, once you specify uh, actual as being greater than zero. And if you specify that the task is completed, um, the finish date will automatically get plugged by Microsoft. Same thing with cost. The, the, the cost is equal to actual cost plus remaining cost. Microsoft project assumes actual start equals planned start. 1% complete is greater than zero. Again, you have to override it. Same thing with actual finish. All right, I think we're going to get to the demo in a moment, but one second poll here. What types of actuals does your organization collect to keep plans up to date? So I'm going to launch that one right now. If you can respond, we'd appreciate it. Are you collecting uh, no actuals, actual labor? Are you collecting actual costs? Are you collecting information about how you're proceeding against the schedule? We've got Strong winner once again. Uh, schedule again, no surprise. Typically, uh, as organizations mature, uh, the first thing that they try to track is is schedule. So tracking against milestones, maybe less concerned about uh, labor and cost. And it, you know, I, I'd say it really depends on the on the project what you really want to focus on. In fact, it's one of the key questions I like to ask my sponsor at the beginning of a project. And it's surprising how I, often I get a perplexed look from the sponsor. I say, what's most important to you, staying on schedule or staying on budget? And you know, you know, the typical answer is both. But then I force the issue, and, and often uh, it's a difficult uh, decision for, for a, a sponsor. But normally when they think about it, it's either cost is driving the project more than uh, schedule, or potentially schedules driving it more than cost. It could be, uh, you know, maybe for new product launch, the schedule is most important because you want to get that product into the marketplace and start to generate revenue. But often, you know, it could be cost that's the most important driver. So I would say ask your sponsor what's really driving the project, what's most important. All right, at this time, I'm going to pass that baton over to Gus, and he's going to show you some tricks around uh, monitoring and controlling using Microsoft Project. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate that. I will um, hide my icons here so that works. 
There we go. Okay, a couple things. Uh, first, first off, uh, where we left off last time in this in this uh, webinar on planning, we sort of threw down a milestone between planning and tracking, and that milestone was the actual baseline of the plan. So, Microsoft Project uh, makes a lot of assumptions, uh, mostly not to nag you all the time. So, so for example. One thing project will not do is if you start to type in actuals without picking a baseline, will not say warning. If you don't have the baseline of your plan, you'll never trigger a variance. Now, a lot of project managers I've met uh, would quite like that idea. Uh, if I ask the project manager, how come you haven't baselined your plan yet? They say, I don't know enough yet. Well, the project has started. We need to pick a baseline. So, just a quick reminder um, one of the things I encourage with uh, with using Microsoft Project is knowing what view to be in. So let's let's just let's pick up where we left off last time on this question of okay, I'm ready to track. I'm going to start putting actuals in. And when I put actual when I put in actuals, the typical uh, reality, as Jim mentioned, is uh, plans don't go the way we expect them to, which means we're going to have variances from our original expectations around schedule cost and labor. Uh, so one of the things we want to do is validate if we have baseline, and uh, my suggestion always is to be in the right view. If we're looking at, looking at task-based information, we should be in a Gantt chart or a task usage view. Uh, it turns out that a Gantt chart is quite adequate, and the first question I ask is, are you seeing the columns you want to see? A common question, what do you see when you set baseline? No common answer, nothing. And, and the reason for that is because we're not in a table that shows us the baseline information. And to add insult to injury, if we go to view table, we will not see the baseline as one of the tables that shows up in the menu. However, there are plenty of tables out there if you click more tables. Okay, so if I had my druthers, I would say, well, let's edit the baseline table and let's check this box called show in menu so that the next time I try to show a table, it shows up in the menu. And it's not alphabetic for some reason, I guess it'll eventually get there. Uh, the other thing is just a quick trick. Right now clicking on the ID column just above uh, the, the little gray box tells me what my, what my table is, what my view is. <clears throat> so I'm in the entry table and the tracking Gantt, which I'll explain in a moment. And if I right mouse click on that, uh, and if I left mouse click, it doesn't select all. If I right mouse click, it gives me a list of tables. And we now see alphabetic. And if I choose baseline, it's pretty easy to figure out if this plan has been baselined. And oh, oh joy, we have um, a plan that was baselined in 1999. So um, you might guess that our training materials have been around for over 15 years. <laughs> okay, so what I might do at this point is I might do something like project set baseline. It's going to warn me. Well, no, it's, the plan's so old it doesn't even know it was baseline. Okay, so so if I baseline my plan, the tracking Gantt tells me what the plan is and how I'm performing against the plan. Okay, so let's let's talk about that for a moment. So I baseline my plan. And the first question we want, or the first uh, topic we want to uh, cover in the first demo is just basic tracking, showing tra the tracking information and what project does. And again, I, I think a mistake uh, that is made oftentimes is not being in the right view. Jim mentioned a rule of the scheduling engine, which is project will plug a start date, an actual start date, if I increase my percent complete above zero. Now, the problem with that is, uh, well, the good news, bad news. The good news is project makes an assumption because putting nothing in there is, is certainly the wrong answer. And that's what's in there now. There's nothing. It says NA in the actual start date. Um, so if you're above 0% uh, complete, there must be something. So that's the good news is it makes an assumption. The bad news is uh, it's always going to plug in the schedule date. And uh, unless you're a magician or, uh, or uh, Nostradamus and can predict the future, uh, your actuals and your plan are going to be different. Okay, so 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 again, the tracking table is going to tell us something. Let's go. To, it's an intuitive name. I'm tracking actuals. Let's go to tracking. By the way, the tracking 
table does not contain the stuff I added to it. Okay, so I'll I have a confession. I've added actual work and actual cost to the normal schedule perspective of the tracking table. The tracking table really tracks the schedule. Okay, so for example, uh, if we look at a task that says obtain approval of the project plan, and I make the I make this 50% complete. Watch what happens with the actual start date. I'll come back to that in a moment. Okay, so so it plugged September 17, 2013. Now, if I add a column called start. We can see that it in fact did copy over the expected uh, start date. Uh, when we see the, the the field start, finish, work, cost, and duration, they're missing a very important adjective. Adjective, you might say, estimated or planned or scheduled. Okay, so whenever you see those uh, those lonely words without any any description, uh, that's that's the plan. That's the thing you're changing if you're updating your plan. Okay. So, for example, let's, let's see what would happen if I change this to the 18th. Now, the actual changes to the 18th. So, the so the actual and the uh, scheduled date are in sync once pro once progress is above zero percent. If I make it 100 percent complete. My finish date picks up 10 7. Now, if I won't surprise you, or you can probably guess now what the finish date is going to say. The scheduled finish date, the planned finish date, in fact, if I finish Slack, that doesn't work. That's for another webinar, critical task management. <laughs> we'll get to that some other day. Let's see if I can be more accurate with my mouse here. So, so uh, we said we were going to do uh, create approval of the project plan. Project plug 10.7 from the scheduled date of 10.7, the finish date. A couple of other things that are happening here too. So, so what's the point? The point is, if you never apply the tracking table and do percent complete tracking, which is common, 78% of people said they track by schedule. I, I think what's also common is um, not being aware of how project sets the schedule date. So we'll never have a variance, basically. Right? Our baseline, as a matter of fact, if I, if I include the baseline at the moment. Uh, insert that column. The baseline start is 9:17. The schedule start is 9:18, and the actual start is 9:18. And the only reason they're out of sync is because I changed it. Okay, I didn't change the finish date. So if we looked at the variance, this would be well. I'll save that for the next demo. <laughs> um, so let's. So so here's something else too. Uh, not everybody does percent complete. Some of you track labor. Some of you collect timesheets. Okay. So there's also an awareness uh, I want to discuss briefly, which is being aware of how the Microsoft Project Scheduling Engine options, default options for the scheduling engine, are set. And we always encourage, and this is just a, a slight review of some things we discussed in the last webinar for planning. When we get to definitions, one of the first things we suggest is pay attention to some of the options. Okay, and the option in this case, if I go to File Options, and I go to my Schedule Options, and I scroll down to where the calculations, the scheduling calculations occur, there's this tongue twister that's not very intuitive that says updating task status updates resource status. Okay, well, gee, what's task status? I don't know. Let's see. If I wave my mouse over this, it says automatically update resource status such as actual and remaining work and cost. Whenever you update task status such as percent complete, actual duration, and remaining duration. What this is saying is if you're doing tracking on sort of a date basis, a schedule basis, a percent complete basis, project with this box check will automatically calculate your actuals. Now it's pretty easy to figure out what's going on here. Okay, if I if I if I show the actual work column, which I inserted into this view, the tracking table does not have the actual work as a native field, but it says the actual work at 100% is 15 hours. So if I were to insert something, let's say the baseline work, any guesses? 
because project automatically calculates my actual work based on my estimate, and I said 100% complete, it says, oh, you must have done what you planned. Okay, so if I do percent complete tracking, and I don't update my dates, and I don't update my actuals, I will always be perfectly on schedule, perfectly on budget, and have my labor perfectly consumed as I expected it. Okay? So, um, if you want to create that illusion, uh, there's, the, uh, there's the method. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, so, what we'll do is, um, one other thing I want to mention is, you know, this, this exercise I like to go through in terms of how to apply the right views. I love the, this example of how do I find what somebody has worked on in my project from an actual standpoint. And uh, as you may recall, in the planning, if you were there in the planning uh, webinar we did last month, uh, we talked about applying the right view. And any time we're trying to look at something over time, we're going to use the usage view. If I say, what if, how, how have people put in time against my schedule, that is a, a usage view. And if I say I want to look at uh, what a person has done, that would be resource usage. So I'm going to scroll down here to my view called resource usage. And a couple of things. When I'm in a usage scale, I have a time scale and I have a field. So to change the fields, we recommend right mouse click. Or you can go to view and change your details, but I'd rather go to right mouse click. Okay, so if I go to details here, I, in this case, it actually splits the screen, so you don't want that. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say you don't want that. That's not what we want at the moment. So I can, um, if I do split the screen, by the way, um, I will see the task or the person and what they're assigned to. If I right mouse click on work, I will see the actual work. We see some actual work here. Okay but it's not spread over time. What if I said, who did what in August? That's why I need this up here. It gives me a calendar breakout. So typically, we would not look in this bottom view with details. We would right mouse click. I'm going to remove work just to make this a clean view. So I uncheck the work and I add the actual work. Okay. If I was looking at a weekly time scale, like let's say I want to see what the timesheets look like that came in, I could go to a weekly scale. Okay. Um, if I wanted to see actual work on the left hand side, I could apply the work table. There's the work table. So now we can see in total where some of the actuals are. And yes, there is some actual work. The other, the other button I like a lot on the view tab is scroll, to, I'm sorry, on the test tab is scroll to task. Chamber my data into my current view. Cha-ching, there it is. Okay. So here's my actuals. So John Tierney had a rough week on the 25th of August, 110 hours of work. Okay. Um, obviously, we had a little demo here that went awry. Um, <laughs> Rebecca Burns uh, almost had a bad, just as bad. Bernie Frazier. But in, you know, so so what's the point? The point is that if you want to see progress from an actual standpoint, you have to know how to set it up. What did I just do? I applied a table on the left side of the usage view, kind of like the Gantt chart on the left, it's a table. On the right, I zoomed in and zoomed out using the view time scale. Okay? And I also right mouse click to bring in my actuals. Well, what if I want to see how it goes against work? I can bring that in as well. Because I'm using percent complete tracking, guess what? All my actual work matches my planned work, which is probably not a great idea. Okay? So we want to do what, what this probably means is I'm doing percent complete tracking, and I'm really not tracking labor. So um, I'm going to turn it back over to Jim uh, to talk about how we turn the corner. So we've collected actuals, and now there's this question about um, what happens. You know, what if I really am putting in real actual dates for for start and finish? What if I'm putting in real work and I'm remaining? And what if my work is exceeding my baseline information? Um, Let's have Jim explain that, and he'll turn it back over to me, and I'll do a demonstration on how this next step works. Excellent. Thank you, Gus. All right, so let's get into uh, you know understanding variances and how we analyze those. So, if we are tracking actuals in terms of labor, cost, and schedule, we need to feed that information into the plan. Some organizations use a timesheet. Some organizations just have the pro project manager manually enter that information. 
however you do it. Uh, it's important to understand, you know, how to use Microsoft Project to understand those variances and look, you know, and then determine, you know, what's the root cause. Certainly, Microsoft Project can't do that for you, but it can tell you what the variances are, and then you can do some exploration by talking to your team members. We're always going to have variances, but uh, it's important to know which variances are really going to impact your project. We can have variances uh, night and day on non-critical path activities, and we're going to be fine. So I think Gus is going to touch on critical path as we turn the, uh, the table back to Gus in a few minutes. If necessary, we have uh, you know impacts or variances on critical path. We want to implement project change control. We can't do project change control, of course, unless you've established a baseline. So understanding the scope, certainly putting together that strong work breakdown structure and baselining your project, you know, we talked about that in the last session, that's critical in order to manage change in a project. Let's revise the plan as appropriate. Certainly if it's, you know, you're impacting the critical path or you're changing the budget, certainly want to get sponsor approval or at least, you know, have them involved in, uh, and make them aware. Again, I've said several times, you know, just getting that right information to the right people at the right time. In terms of variances, these are definitions. So the work variance is, is going to equal that plan work minus the baseline work. So when I first started using Microsoft Project, I found this was a little counterintuitive because um, if my work actually exceeds the baseline, it's a positive number. But obviously, that, that's an unfavorable situation. So just keep in mind, a positive value in Microsoft Project is an unfavorable situation in, from a variance perspective. And you can see the rest of the calculations. They all basically work the same. In terms of what the, uh, the tool is going to look like, we're going to have not applicable uh, before we apply actual progress. So we're not going to have any variances. Once we apply, obviously, uh, you can see here the work is now 56 hours as we've adjusted from the original. The, uh, the variance shows 16 hours, and that is, in fact, unfavorable. We're, we've exceeded the plan. Same with cost in this situation. Project reporting, you know, critical, again, Getting that feedback, the right information at the right level of detail out of this out of the product. Gus is going to show you this in a moment, so I'm going to talk briefly. You know, what is a view? It's really a combination in Microsoft Project of filtering the information, uh, applying the right table, and potentially grouping that information. So a filter is a way to uh, select a subset of information that you want to focus on at the moment without being overwhelmed by the entire project plan. You know, if you've had plans of, you know, a couple thousand items, it's important to understand filtering. And it's pretty easy to do in, in Microsoft Project. Applying a table, this is one of Gus's favorite tricks. It's basically a predefined uh, uh, columns that can more quickly get you to the information that you want to see. Uh, the other alternative is to, to insert columns. And grouping is just that, you know, uh, sorting the information by some attribute of, you know, of the task, if you're looking at task information. All right, I am going to launch pool number three. And the question here is, for, for whom do you develop reports out of Microsoft Project? Is it, uh, is it management? Stakeholders, team members, or none of the above. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I launched the wrong poll. <laughs> okay. That's right. We'll just use this one. What do we have out there, Gus? Do you use Microsoft Project to develop reports to management, stakeholders, and or team members? That's okay for this poll. I think it works well.
the data is coming in, and I feel like a, a Walter Conkright or someone right at the elections here, with with 73% of the results in. Uh, interesting. I'm not not as strong as I would expect for yeses um, or yays, if you will. Yays and nos. So 60% yes, 40% no. Gus, any thoughts on that? Um, I think if we got more specific about what's coming out, I, I guess I can believe that some of the schedule reporting is coming out uh, maybe 70% of the time. Uh, we see less being metrics based I think in, in the status reports. I think if we ask the question, are you using the real numbers to produce status reports, I, I believe we would see more of a skew of uh, maybe 10 or 20 percent of the projects out there. In other words, are we really coming clean using the numbers from projects to do the reporting? And we see that uh, certainly in the minority, wouldn't you say, Jim? Yeah, I, mean, I think I think over the years you're seeing a little bit more emphasis on getting you know the real true numbers. Uh, around projects as, as organizations mature. I think, you know, if you look back 10 years ago, um, probably, probably just managing the schedule milestones was sufficient for most organizations. But I think you are, you are seeing uh, more progress and more maturity as uh, organizations uh, increase their awareness and understanding of the value of, of project management. Okay, we're going to jump back. Uh, do our second and final demo of the day, phase two, uh, you're looking at variance analysis. I'll hand it back to Gus. Speaking of numbers, Jim, I just happen to have a few. Uh, we will look, let's see, so let's start in the Gantt chart. And if I was doing tracking with the tracking table, which I uh, will apply, and I was doing something like uh, let's see, I'm going to look at some of these percent completes. And you can see that in a lot of cases, uh, these things that are 100% complete, the baseline start and the start are pretty closely in sync. So let's, uh, with the actual, so let's, let's bring some reality in here. Like in other words, if I, even though we have a lot of progress here, if I apply the variance table on a plan that it has really, where, where the user, the project manager has not been changing any of the dates, we can see the only one that has a variance are, are the ones that I was playing around with. Okay, so if I if I scroll down through the plan, we look at the start and finish variances. Even though we see a lot of progress here, we see a lot of fictitious results. In my opinion, fictitious results uh, against the average plan. I mean, even if the project finishes on time, usually some of, some of the tasks are struggling through some of their uh, goals to be meet the schedule. So let's uh, you know if, if we change, let's go back to the tracking table. And if I were to put in something like 25% for this uh, task, and I say, well, it was supposed to start on the 7th, but it didn't start on Monday. It started on uh, the following Monday. And if I change this one to 25%, or let's say 50%, and it was supposed to start, you can see I'm going to be, uh, well, let, me, let me do this slowly. It says that A in the actual start, okay, so I'm going to change it to 50%. And now we see uh, that the, the, the start date of 919 is in sync with the actual of 919, and let's say au contraire. This also is uh, planning to come in late. And there's a couple of interesting things going on here. Um, if I look at the variance on task 9, it turns out that not all variances are created equal. Okay, for example, if I look at a task that's complete that has a variance of four and a half days, that's different than a task that's not complete that has four and a half days. Okay, so if I, if I look at my variance table and say, well, hold on a second, what would happen if I added percent complete? Now I get a view of things that I may be able to impact that started late but doesn't have to finish late. Well, I don't know. If it's halfway done, maybe there's something we can do to take that project or this task that was supposed to finish on 919. Well, wait, I'm sorry, my finish variance is zero. I'm sorry, look at this one. But it's supposed to start on, uh, finish on uh, 
10.14 and is going to finish on 10.18, is there something I can do to pull that in? Okay, so variances happen in a variety of ways, and, and here's, you know, here's, a, here's another thing to think about. What about this field called critical? Okay, there's a field called critical. It has a yes, no. So this is on the critical path that it's going to be four and a half days. Uh-oh. Or if you want to be a mathematician about it, I'm a numbers guy. I prefer to use something called total slack. If I can get my alphabet going here. <laughs> Total slack. Okay, so now we can start seeing some of this story about what the critical path is. But the point is, as we start looking at variances, there's a question that says, which ones am I most concerned about? Okay, Jim also uh, mentioned uh, the root cause uh, analysis, right? So it's one thing to say we have variances. It's quite a different thing to say what why do we have variances? What's the problem? And uh, I'll, I'm going to go to that in a moment by doing the following. If I go to the work table, and I wouldn't recommend doing this in real life, but just bear with me for a second. I've got a 120-hour task. It's got 90 hours of actual, 30 hours of remaining, and it's, and it's percent completed, 75%. So I'm guessing that looks pretty clean to me. I'm guessing those actuals. Would you guess, Jim, were calculated by project? Absolutely. Three quarters of it is 90 <laughs> is actual. Okay, so let's add some reality. Yeah, I did 90 hours. Or let's say let's say it this way. Yeah, I did 75%. Okay, so here's how I did my 75%. I did 120 hours of work. And I have 40 hours left. There's your 75%. Right? So yeah, well, I'm 75%, but what's the story? Well, the story is... It was supposed to be a 120-hour task. Now it's a 160-hour task. And oh, by the way, if I'm really being accurate here, I might say not only did I did I put in 120 hours on a 120-hour task, and I'm not done yet. But l l let's see what would happen if we talked about, for example, the variance on this thing. So let's let's insert a column called the finished variance. So not surprisingly, with those additional 40 hours, this is going to come in five days late. Uh, the point three three probably means it started after 8 o'clock in the morning. That's a, not, not something worth uh, going through today. But the point is, as we look at these variances, uh, they tell us a story. Okay? Uh, let's see. I'm going to go over uh, one or two more. Okay? So I'm going to put an actual in here of 40 hours and a remaining Oh, that's nice. And remaining of zero. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at variances by resource. What a concept. Okay, so it turns out my resource is also on the baseline work. If I give you a thousand hours to work on a project, that's your baseline. So if you're running over all the time, I can start looking at that. So maybe if I do some root cause analysis, maybe I start looking at this thing called the resource sheet, which becomes quite interesting when I start applying the work table to that view. And now we start saying, where are my variances with my resources? And we can start zeroing in on where some of the overages are starting to occur. Okay, now this is a very small sample, obviously. In a, in a large project, we might see somebody with 1,000 hours of baseline work, maybe 800 hours of actual work. But when we look at the remaining, they also have 800 hours. So their total work is now 1,600 against a baseline of 1,000. Hey, maybe we've got a problem here. You know, and then and even further, what's the problem? Why can't get you, why can't you get your, uh, your work done on time? Um, a common answer is you didn't ask me how long you thought it would take. Or uh, I need training. Or you assign me to a task that I'm not skilled for. Or, 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 right? So uh, uh, I'm booking my hours to your project even though I'm working on another project. <laughs> that happens. Um, not that anybody's going to admit it. So we can see here the story that starts to emerge. And by the way, one other thing on the Gantt chart, when I have this zero task, okay, every anytime I'm showing the summary task for the entire project, I'm getting this story for everything. My total work, my total baseline work, my variance on work, my actuals of work, I change to the variance table, I look at the top, 
Here's the story on how the project's supposed to start, when it really started, that have a variance of the start uh, expectations. And so these are all views, right? Views, tables, filters. I can filter. I'll say, just give me uh, the things that are uh, the highest variances. Show me the ones that are five days and 5.33 days. Or I can go into a filter here and edit a filter and say, give me late tasks. Or how about slipping tasks, one of my favorites. If I go to more filters and look at slipping tasks, I always like to show this because what it tells me is the actual finish is NA. It hasn't finished yet. The baseline finish is not equal to NA. It has been baselined. The finish, the current estimated finish, is greater than the original finish. It's slipping. It's not done yet. It's forecasted to finish late. This is a hot spot in my plan. I could even add and critical equals yes. Now I've really got my hot spots. These are things that are going to impact the entire schedule. Okay? And of course, if you go to reports, these are all reports. Right? Everything I'm showing, every time I show a view, I'm showing a report. But there is this nice dashboard capability where I can show a project overview and see where things are overall for the project. Or if I go back and I look at uh, something like the uh, upcoming task or the cost overview, you know, how am I burning against my expectations, my total cost, my remaining cost, my percent complete. Okay, and, again, and, the, and the last thing I'll mention from a reporting standpoint is these visual reports where I can begin to analyze the work and the cost over time. Okay, so if I were, for example, to go to a usage report and say, show me the budget cost report, I could actually begin to put this stuff into Excel. Project's going to take this data, run it through an OLAP cube using SQL, it's going to cast it into Office Web Components for, for Excel and begin to graph this information, uh, you know, cost, uh, baseline versus actual. Uh, not only, not only uh, uh, some information uh, from a graphical standpoint by quarter, but even going in to the individual uh, quarters and years, I could add a uh, task in here. I can start showing what's happening at the project level. I can scroll down here, start adding the resource dimension to it, and see how my resources are being used across the project by quarter. Okay, I can exclude certain quarters. I can decide which years I really want to look at. Okay, and look at just the 2013 and see how things are going there. I can just zero in on certain quarters. So very, very extensive in terms of the capabilities. And all of this is predicated on an assumption that I've got that nice data out there. Okay, I've put my assignment information in. I've done my planning. I've baselined my plan. I've kept my plan up to date. There's some really nice things that can happen. And the last thing I'll do before I show it to uh, pass it back to Jim to wrap us up is on the Gantt chart when I'm doing usage uh, at the project level. I can also do that on the time scale. Okay, so if I show, for example, task usage, and I and I zoom out. To something like let's say a monthly view, and I take out the work, the cost, or I could even put in the actual cost to see how we're burning, okay? And I go ahead and slide that task to my current view. I can start saying, here's my spend by month, here's my actuals by month, right. here's my actual work, here's my actual cost, okay? And all this is based on the you know uh, the, the fact that project will move all this data around for you as you apply the actuals and look at the variances. So that's my short demo today. We could spend three days on this, but we don't have three days, so I'll pass it over to Jim. Thanks, Gus. That's really powerful. I think especially the um, these tracking views where you could look at actual cost versus cost by month, for example, or actual work versus plan work. Those are very, very powerful to kind of get a, a big picture view of your project progress. All right, we got about a little less than 10 minutes left, so we're going to launch poll number four here. What is your organization's greatest area of opportunity to improve? Is it uh, better project manager skills, executive support, process improvement? Uh, is it around culture change or use of uh, PPM technology? We're actually going to make you think more than a yes/no here. 
All right, we'll take a moment here. We're seeing a theme. The big winner again is culture change with almost 50%. And process improvement as a number two. So changing the organization's thoughts and perspective, maybe getting the executive support, I think is tied to that. And then improving processes. So how can we improve, you know, in terms of uh, your organization's capabilities? No surprise, you know, we have our own methodology in terms of helping organizations improve. We call it the VIA, the uh, vision, implement, and adopt. And if, if you joined us in the past, this is going to look real familiar, so I'm going to kind of fly through this quickly. Visioning is where we we take an assessment of the current state of an organization looking across the scope of the project, whether it be you know risk management, project scheduling, whatever it might be. We develop a future state, you know, where is the organization, where would they like to go in terms of improvement? And then we build a roadmap to help organizations get from point A to point B. We then implement the plan through a typical project life cycle, you know, requirements design implement and adopt. And we do, again, we find adoption is critical. Making sure that once you have a new application or a new process, do people really understand how to execute? Um, where do they need help? Do they need, do they need coaching, mentoring, additional training? How can we continue to improve our processes and technology around project management? Uh, last poll of the day, real quick. Uh, would you like us to contact you to discuss how your project management improvement methodology can help you? Throw that out for a moment. And then we'll go into our summary. It does seem like some organizations, you know, would like some help. Happy to do that. I'm going to wrap up that poll. And these are some of the offerings that we provide our clients. Uh, we talked briefly about you know analysis, vision, roadmap. That's a strategy to take you from your current state to to where you'd like to be as an organization from a maturity perspective. Again, it could be a, a technology improvement, it could be process improvement, or or education. We offer a variety of training programs uh, around leadership, project management, risk management. We, uh, we're a Microsoft partner, uh, helping organizations implement Microsoft Project Server, or what's now Project Online, if you like to be in the cloud. And Gus has a book out there called Project Microsoft Project Training uh, 2013, a project management training guide. We're always looking for good project managers and folks that uh, work in the, pro the you know, PMO disciplines. If you're interested, there's some information. And in terms of, you know, kind of our parting gifts, you can go to projectassistance.com slash webinar. Uh, we'll provide a chapter around uh, project reporting that comes right out of the Microsoft Project uh, 2013, Gus's book. There's a promo code if you want to buy the book and get 15% off. Uh, there's a discount on an upcoming leadership workshop. Um, I'll talk about that more in a moment. And certainly downloads of today's slide deck and recording. We also provide quite a few uh, how-to videos, both on Microsoft Project and other project management processes. And they're good for PDUs, by the way, right? So if you, you know, they're an hour each. Uh, you get a PDU for today's uh, webinar, and there's others out there if you want to review them. Absolutely. Uh, we have a to be announced date for our next uh, webinar, acquiring the best talent for crucial project leadership roles. Hope you join us for that. And just a little more on uh, product, project leadership workshop. Uh, leadership is taken, not given. 
Well, we're uh, PMI uh, New York City uh, is hosting us up there in uh, Microsoft uh, at the Microsoft office on Times Square. It's a full day workshop. Uh, I lead it. It's a very popular, entertaining, and valuable uh, workshop. And you know, there's a lot of focus uh, out in the world today for project managers to be more than managers and really be leaders and entrepreneurs. So uh, we will cover that. We have uh, already have a, a good. Uh, registration list already and, uh, and growing fast. So uh, that's going to happen on the 12th. Hope to see you there if you're in the New York area. Very nice. Um, well, we're about out of time. We don't have much for Q&A. Do we have any questions real quick, Dan, that you've seen coming through? Uh, yes, we have some questions coming in. Um, one is, can you use MS projects for portfolio management? Jim, I'm going to let you take that one. <laughs> well, <clears throat> Microsoft Project, if, if that's what the person is asking, uh, certainly is going to enable you to manage the project schedule and manage variances. From a portfolio perspective, uh, you know, certainly the portfolio could be impacted by projects that are running later or are impacted. So uh, I guess the answer is yes, you certainly use Microsoft Project. Uh, to contribute toward understanding the progress of the portfolio. Uh, if the question is really around Microsoft Project Server, Project Online, yeah, we didn't cover it today, but Microsoft Online has uh, some excellent functionality around analyzing projects from a business value perspective, uh, selecting projects at that macro level, and really prioritizing, you know, kind of stack ranking projects both within a department and or an organization. We have another question coming in. Um, what is your thought about the rules of complete of 0 out of 100, 50 out of 100, or 20 out of 100? Percentage we're talking about? That's a question that just shows me part of it. Oh, what are your thoughts about the rules of completion? Oh, I, I like it. I, I certainly like it. But yeah, thanks, Jeff. I saw the percent. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I like it. I mean, I, I think it's better than nothing. You know, and I, and I think if you're using percent complete, if you're, you know, if you're if you're saying you're 57 percent complete, I mean, what's the credibility there anyhow, right? So I see a very common uh, zero or 100. Which is either it's, it hasn't started or it's done. Uh, I like 50 better than nothing. So uh, yeah, it's in progress. You know, maybe 20s or 25s in between is okay. So you know, I you know I I, I would prefer to base those percentages on something that's based on uh, in reality uh, from the labor standpoint. But let's face it, not not everybody does that. Not every organization demands it. Uh, a lot of IT project management is done around schedules because of the sunk cost of the staffing of IT against the how it's building against the business. So um, I do. I like all those examples, Jeff, and I think they get better uh, as as you get into the 20 versus the 0 100 or, or 0 50 100. So good question. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would just add to that. Uh, we would suggest you know start simple, right? If yeah, you just go 0 50 100. <laughs> that's better than not having any information in the plan. So if you want to start simple, 0 50 100. And progress from there. Amen. So that's all we have today. Uh, thank you so much for hanging on with us. And uh, remember to collect within the next 24 hours. We'll have all of those parting gifts up on projectassistance.com/webinar.